Okay, so I'm Sofian Kazi. Uh, I work for Pivotal, as does David here, uh, based in London. Today's session, how many of you have used Spring Boot before? Excellent. Session over. <laughs> <laughs> so the session, as you said, it was going to be a two-hour walkthrough of building a fairly complex application composed of many microservices. Um, given that we've got 30 minutes, we're going to run it as a sort of, hey, we'll give you links to the, to the workshop afterwards. You can do it in your own time. Um, we're going to start off with a quick intro of what is Spring Boot. Um, you're not going to go to the labs now. Uh, but if you were, you would follow this URL. And as a set of some basic primitive getting started to Spring Boot uh, labs, um, they walk through building your first application, changing the configuration of uh, that application so it can run on different app servers, deploying it to Cloud Foundry, uh, writing your own error handlers. It's fairly comprehensive. It's about a half day's worth of content. So follow that in your own time. I'm going to pretend I'm running this lab. I hope most of you will probably know the website I'm about to go to. Uh, which is uh, Spring Initializer, which is not on this URL, it's on Firefox. This is why David's here. Makes me look good. There you go. So if, if you've never used Spring Initializer before, what does, how does Josh describe this? It says uh, happy place. Happy place, yeah. This is a great place you can go to just to start off. It's a bit like... Um, a little wizard for giving you an application, I'd say, hey, I'd like a, a nice, simple Spring Boot app using Gradle. I'm going to just accept the defaults for my package, my application name, and I want to use a certain dependency, so I can just type in a dependency here and say, I want to use, I want to create a Spring Web app. I want to create a very basic web app which exposes a RESTful um, endpoint. I click on Web, I click Generate Project, and that little fancy animation means I've got a zip somewhere. Um, Firefox sticks it in Downloads. I think, and okay. It's unzipped already. Oh, okay, even better. Now I've just got to find STS. Okay. So I'm going to import that into Spring Tool Suite. Uh, I chose Gradle. So where are we? Over here. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Dpinto. Downloads, Drop one. demo two. And with a bit of luck, <coughs> this should work. So for those of you who have done Spring Boot, it does get a bit more advanced than this, don't worry. We're just going to watch my application downloads and loads of libraries. Um, so just out of curiosity, um, people who are using Spring Boot, you're using Spring Web, Spring Data. How many people are using very complicated Spring apps? Uh, define complicated as yourself. I've got people staring at me. No one Who's using Spring Cloud? That's good. How many people are using sp deploying Spring apps to Cloud Foundry? Okay, cool. We didn't really need to be here at all. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it's obviously, I, uh, here we go, it's kicking off. This is just downloading a bunch of libraries which is needed. I'm just going to say, hey, accept, I would like to import this project. Gives me uh, an empty, applica empty application over here. In a minute, I guess it will. Since it's downloading stuff. Uh, hasn't appeared as yet. It's in other projects. Ah, okay. Demo. Okay. So, uh, that's, not the one. that's not the one. Demo two, I guess. There we go. Right. So, Here's my amazingly complicated application. I know it's a Spring Boot app because it's got an annotation at the beginning saying, hey, I'm a Spring Boot app. I'd like to make this a simple app which exposes a RESTful endpoint. I'm just going to create a new class here just to make life a bit easier for me. Uh, I'm going to call it my controller, if I could spell. And 
and Spring Boot makes life easy for me. I used to work for a company. They've got three letters in their name. Some people say it stands for I've been married. Um, and in those days, we never had Spring or, or any kind of clever stuff. We used to do a lot of big, heavy monoliths. So the idea that I could come along and just say, hey, I'd like to create an app and just write an annotation at the beginning was really revolutionary for me. Uh, it's not completing because I guess it hasn't got its libraries and we're live. There we go, rest controller. Uh, zoom it in. Okay, yeah, sorry, I forget that you guys want us. Right. Yeah. Right. So all I've done is I created a new class and I've added a simple annotation at the beginning. And this is going to be a little hint for Spring Boot when it's running my app to say, this is a class which is going to expose restful endpoints. And I'm going to create the best method in the world, something that just says, hello world. That's about the sort of level of my knowledge that I can get to. And I'm going to say return hello. And I like to execute this method every time someone hits my web app at a specific URL. Uh, let's make that string. I'm just checking how many people are awake. Um, so, again, Sp Spring Boot makes this really easy for me. I can just say, map this to the path, hello. Okay. Now, in the old days, when I used to work for that big company, this would have taken me a couple, about half a day of configuring and kind of playing around with XML files and opening up the web.xml web and putting port mappings and stuff. But now, in theory, I should just be able to hit run as Spring Boot app. <coughs> That's going to run the last configuration, I believe, which is this one. And it's running the another application. So right click on the demo tool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry. Let's close that. That one, I guess. Spring Boot application. So, for those of you who have never used Spring Boot before, Spring Boot has looked at the configuration of my application. It's realized that it's got a Spring Web dependency. So it's automatically enabled Tomcat for me as a container as a runtime for my application. It started it up on a default port of 8080. Uh, if I now just went to localhost 8080, I don't think you've got enough windows open. Could you open a few more, David? I'll try next time. Yeah. I didn't map anything to that specific URL. What I did was I mapped it to hello. It should say hello. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm available all three <laughs> days for the summit. Yeah. Now, let's get back to something more important, uh, which was our... Keep on going. Some more. More, more, more. There we go. Now, the, the labs that are in this URL are far more, far more sophisticated. They walk through things like Actuator. They walk through changing uh, to use Jetty instead of Tomcat. They walk through putting your own error handlers, putting metrics, fairly a comprehensive bunch of stuff. If you don't think that's enough, you could go to spring.io slash guides. There's loads more guides and doing consuming data from Facebook, Twitter, etc. Really useful. And these slide decks will be made available so you can grab the, the URL after that. Now, we chose Spring Boot because we just think it makes life really easy. It's kind of made it, the, the speed of building up a bit of an application is just really quicker. It, it's really quick. It's great for building microservices. As you use Spring Boot to build several other microservices, you're going to reach some of the problems that people have had when they've gone down this route where, hey, now there's this loads of complexity where one microservice talks to another microservice, talks to another microservice. I need some way of kind of mitigating if one microservice was down, discovering other microservices. I need patterns to help us kind of overcome some of these issues, specifically storing configuration, uh, load balancing, monitoring, et cetera. And so the purpose of today's talk really was, if we were doing a hands-on session, was to get you guys to build some of this. We're going to just rush through and show you a pre-built application and give you some, some links to where you can find out more about this. So what am I talking about? Consider this application made up of three microservices. You've got a web front end, you've got some back, two sort of back ends in two different domains, one for customer data, one for stores data. 
there's clearly s some sort of dependencies that are loosely uh, coupled to each other, but they, have a, they need to know about each other's service to provide the functionality that they um, exhibit. How does customers know where stores is running? How does the web front end know where customers and stores is running? What happens if stores goes down? Does the whole application die? That's not a good practice. Now, if we can have some other supporting technology, like some sort of service discovery component alongside this, they could say, hey, every time a microservice comes up, register with me and I'll make a note of where you're running, what you, your URL is. Then other clients could then consume that at runtime. We could have a configuration server that's separate to this that stores vital information needed at runtime, that it isn't hard coded in the application, makes life a lot simpler. What we're going to talk about today is how some of these components, which you know, if you follow, follow Netflix, OSS, and some of these ad patterns, you might, you might be familiar with this, how some of this technology is packed in to Pivotal's uh, implementation of Cloud Foundry. So we have a component called Spring Cloud Services Suite, which is an add-on for our enterprise version of Cloud Foundry. It gives you a lot of these uh, features out of the box and makes it really easy for you to build your applications using um, those capabilities. And to show this, we've got an application called Spring Boot Trader, written by my colleague David Pinto. And he's going to walk you through some of the architecture and sh show you some of the benefits and show you how he's implemented and ta may take advantage of these um, features. And that, you know, I'll hand yeah, over to you. Good. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the good news is I'm not going to write any code because I did that before. And I'm just going to show you how easy or hard or difficult it is to implement some of these patterns that help you live in a cloud native world. So the first one is configuration server or configuration management. When you've got tens, hundreds, thousands of microservices, you might want to share some properties for the instance running. Uh, that are running in Cloud Foundry. There could be multiple instances with different properties um, for different purposes. So what is the best way, or what is one way of dealing with configuration? You want that, those properties to be auditable. So when someone changes that, you know that that change was made, and you want to propagate that change to all of your instances. Within Pivotal Cloud Foundry, we've got a, a Spring Cloud Config server that connects to a Git repository to um, uh, grab all of the properties that you need for your uh, applications. And then each application goes to this configuration server to pick the properties that it needs to in order to run. How do we set this up? Well, it's really complicated. Um, if I find the right window, there we go. Uh, let me just pick one of my services, like the user service, aptly named because it deals with users. And I go to my uh, build.gradle file or my pom file, and I just select one dependency, which is, there we go. So by adding this dependency, it tells Spring Boot to um, go and grab the properties from this configuration server. By default, it will go to a specific um, uh, local host and port number. But if you're running Pip Cloud Foundry, it will pick up where this service is running automatically for you. So that's it. No more to do to get the configuration management, apart from setting your own properties. Uh, okay. Next one is service discovery. If you've got tens, hundreds, thousands of microservices running in the cloud, they can move about. They can be in one place today, and they can move to another place tomorrow. How do you figure out where they're running at runtime? Well, one technique to do this, and that's what Netflix uses, is for each application to register itself and say, this is my name, and this is where I live, so that other applications can go to this yellow pages and, and ask for particular services. It's like a, a, a directory. Again, this is very difficult to implement in Spring Boot. And I'm sure I've got one open here. Uh, Suf so showed you how to build a Spring Boot application with this annotation. To add the service discovery capability, all you need is this other annotation. 
This means that the application will register itself and gives you the capability to look for other services that you've got access to. Again, no other configuration needed. In Pivotal Cloud Foundry, where the service disc, uh, registry is living is plumbed in into your application automatically. Yes. Here we go. The next one is if you're dependent on other microservices when you call them, you don't want to fail if those microservices aren't there. There is one rule in the cloud world, which is thing, bad things do happen. Things fail. Hardware goes away, memory goes away, applications go away. So how from your application can you ensure that you stay alive even though other applications that you depend on fail? The circuit breaker pattern is, is how to, f to sustain failure, how to be tolerant to failures. You've got a primary path where uh, that's your dependent service that you're calling all the time. If that dependent service goes down, this circuit will open and it will stop contacting that primary service and it will go to a fallback service or a method. Or you can just deal with that problem right there and then. Over time, the circuit will try to close again and go to that primary service. And it will try it to see if it's come back to life. And if it is, it will open up the floodgates and we'll start contacting it again. How do we do this in the code? Well, it's extremely difficult, as you can imagine. All we need to do is annotate a method with hystrix commands, and you give it the fallback method. You can have as many fallback methods as you want, and you can cascade down. So you don't just have to have a primary and a secondary service. You can have a third, fourth, and fifth service if you're that paranoid. There we go. Um, Pivotal Cloud Foundry gives you visibility on what is happening with your circuit breakers. You can have as many as you want in your application, and they'll show up in a nice little dashboard, say how many calls you're getting a second, whether the circuit is open or closed, um, and, and what the, um, the, the, the platform is doing for you. So the next thing that is really important in cloud, uh, in microservices world, in the cloud native world, is how to trace a request, a user request throughout your microservices. This is good to find out where the latency is within that call, but also to figure out where the problem, where the problem may exist. Um, Spring Cloud gives you this flexibility, it gives you this ability uh, with Spring Cloud Sleuth, and it injects traceability through all of those requests, and it gives you a, an ID that follows that request across all of your microservices. Um, Again, as you can imagine, this is super complicated to do. Um, and if I show you the build.gradle again, this is another dependency, which is this one, Spring Cloud Sleuth. And Spring Boot will take care of everything that it needs to do to give you that traceability across multiple applications that are developed by different teams. And you get that traceability in a nice little UI which I don't have running here to show you, but um, you can trace your calls, your user requests from application to application. How are we doing for time? Ooh. So uh, Zipkin is the UI that shows you that traceability going from one microservice to the other of your user request. It gives you a nice little um, traceability, how long that request is spending in each application as well, which is very important when you're trying to performance test your, your overall system. So to summarize, what have we shown you over here? Well, A, you need a platform to run your microservices and to link them all together. You need a framework that allows you the velocity of development to spin up these microservices, test them, give them to your users, and get the feedback. Spring Cloud gives you the framework to fix some of the challenges you see in the cloud world. 
whether that's configuration management or service discovery. And then you need Pivotal Cloud Foundry to run all of these uh, applications and microservices for you, and it will benefit from the day to operations and self-healing and so on. So your application, David, is it in GitHub? It is in GitHub. Um, there was a link mm -hmm. over there. These slides will be made available, so you can just click on the link and it will take you to this page where you can find out more about the, the, micro, the Spring Boot Trader application, which is a set of four microservices. Very soon it will be five. Uh, and it uses all of these cloud capabilities to register themselves, discover themselves. Um, all the configuration is shared amongst all of the microservices, so they all have the same properties. Okay. And do you want to... We are have to ob obligatory mention to mention that we are hiring at Pivotal if anybody's interested in working at us. Uh, there's a guy in our office called Harry Kang will be very pleased to see this slide. Um, any questions? Yes. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got an answer for that? Yes, I do. Um, that's a good question. How do you um, protect your sensitive data in the Git repository? And there's a couple of different levels that you can go to. One is protect your Git repository itself, so it's not public, especially in github.com. Uh, the other one is you can encrypt properties. So when you put it into your Git repository, that password is already encrypted, and only the config server will be able to decrypt it. Does that answer your question? Good. What if I want to make changes to my properties while the application's running? Make the changes. It's absolutely fine. Then I need to restart my app? You can make the changes in, the, in your GitHub repository, and you can tell your applications to refresh their properties. You can. Uh, so the question is, do you need to have different repositories for production, development, testing, the different environments? Um, there's different ways of dealing with that. Um, Git provides you with a lot of capabilities in terms of branches, um, different commits, different so on. And you can make use of that from the configuration server. So you can point your configuration server to the production branch or to the development branch. You can also use different repositories if you, if you want. Um, it's really down to the structure of your organization on the best way to deal with that. So th the question is, if, uh, if you want to use other registry services like console, is there a way to do that? Um, Spring Cloud gives you that uh, capability, but you need to deploy your own console cluster in order to provide that, that infrastructure. As part of Pivotal Cloud Foundry, currently we're using Eureka as that, that service um, implementation. The questions are getting trickier by the, <laughs> by the time. Um, no we're running out of time, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> time is over. Um, I, I, do have a, I do have an answer for that. Uh, so the question is, uh, it's great if you're using Spring to use all of these patterns. What about if you're using other languages like Go or Python or these funky languages? Um, there are libraries for these languages to work with the Spring Cloud patterns. They are emerging, so there's already one for Go, um, one for Python, I believe, and there'll be more coming along the lines. Um, I'm sure that .NET, if you're that way inclined, they've got a project called Steel Toe, which is to, to kind of capture the Spring Boot and Spring Cloud functionality within the, the .NET environments. I think we've got time for one more question, as long as it's an easy one. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, it's not an easy yeah, question. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> um, so the, the question is, does Sleuth, that traceability capability, have any performance impact on the running application? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, it will have some impact, obviously, but it's minimal, minimal because it's done asynchronously on the calls. Um, m or most of it is done asynchronously on the calls. Um, if you're just logging the, the correlation ID uh, to the logs, the, the performance penalty is minimal. If you're actually streaming those calls for the, for the traces into Zipkin, for example, that's done asynchronously, either through a bus or through HTTP requests. So it shouldn't have much of an impact on the latency of the application. Okay, on that note, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We are going to be at the Pivotal booth if you've got any more questions. I think we're there for um, half one today. Uh, but if you don't find us, there are other Pivotal colleagues around who can answer your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.